When we hear about cholesterol, usually what comes to mind is LDL and HDL as shown here. But there are other forms of cholesterol that impact health. And these include lipoprotein A, so LP little a, but also remnant cholesterol, which is uh, defined in the fasting situation as the combination of intermediate density lipoprotein, IDL, and very low density lipoprotein, VLDL. And again, in the fasting state, this can be calculated by the formula total cholesterol TC minus HDL minus LDL equals remnant cholesterol or IDL plus VLDL. So uh, in this video, I'm gonna talk about VLDL. So why is VLDL important? First, it's a marker of fatty liver. So uh, let's walk our way through this data. So in the situation where there's obesity and insulin resistance and or a hypercaloric diet, uh, these situations uh, trigger an increase in lipolysis, so fat breakdown in adipose tissue, which leads to systemic increases in free fatty acids, FFAs. Now, uh, also note that a hypercaloric diet on its own can induce increases in uh, circulating levels of free fatty acids. So increased circulating levels of free fatty acids are then taken up by the liver, where they are packaged into TGs, triglycerides, and then with an increase in triglycerides in the liver, uh, this leads to accumulation of lipid droplets uh, in the liver, which is known as steatosis. Now, additionally, when there's an increase in lipid droplets in a given tissue, in this case, the liver, uh, these lipid droplets are packaged with cholesterol and other uh, membrane proteins into VLDL. So if there are increased circulating levels of VLDL, that can be one measure of a fatty liver. So uh, also note that VLDL increases during aging and higher levels of the VLDL are associated with heart disease related outcomes. So let's have a look at that data. So here we can see uh, aging related data for VLDL. And in youth, uh, it defined as men that are uh, 15 to 24 years old, men and women that are 15 to 24 years old, we can see that VLDL less than 20 in men and less than 15 in women is found in youth. And then going uh, through aging, so going from 25 years old up to 79 years old for both men and women, we can see that VLDL levels increase uh, up to about 30 uh, in both men and women. So also note that higher levels of VLDL are associated with an increased cardiovascular disease risk. And in this case, cardiovascular disease was defined as risk for acute myocardial infarction, so heart attack, sudden coronary death, and other coronary death. So in this study, when using less than 20 milligrams per deciliter for VLDL as the reference, we can see that having VLDL in the 20 to 29 range uh, or uh, greater than 30 was associated with a significantly increased risk for adverse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes. So for uh, in the 20 to 29 range, it was associated with a 38% increased risk and uh, VLDL greater than 30 when, com uh, when compared with less than 20 was associated with a 44% increased risk for these adverse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes. Now, other studies, independent of the, you know, the association for VLDL with cardiovascular disease risk, other studies have evaluated associ associations for remnant cholesterol with cardiovascular CVD, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. So uh, if you remember on the first slide, remnant cholesterol uh, in the fasting state is def defined as the, the sum of VLDL plus IDL. Now, uh, it may be that remnant cholesterol is almost exclusively VLDL. So here's my, uh, just as an example, my, my data from my uh, last blood test, and it includes total cholesterol, HDL, VLDL, and LDL. And if you remember the calculation for remnant cholesterol, which equals total cholesterol minus LDL minus HDL, again, and only in the fasting state, we can see that my VLDL equals 13 and there's no IDL. So from this, I would posit that studies that have reported remnant cholesterol in the fasting state, as I'm gonna show these three studies going forward, uh, when they report remnant cholesterol, it's almost exclusively VLDL. So in this study, remnant cholesterol, but not LDL cholesterol, was associated with the incidence of cardiovascular disease. And in this case, cardiovascular disease was defined as risk for heart attack, stroke, or, or cardiovascular death. So was uh, HDL or LDL associated with these adverse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes? And this is in a study of about 6,900 subjects. So first, HDL was not associated with these adverse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes. As you can see, when comparing people who didn't have a cardiovascular event with people who had a cardiovascular event, HDL levels were not significantly different. And then when looking at it as a continuous variable, so higher levels of HDL, are they associated with uh, risk? In, in other words, the hazard ratio, did it increase? Uh, and it didn't, you can see by the p-value. 
Similarly, LDL was not different between the two groups, no event versus event, and higher levels of LDL were not associated with a higher risk, a significantly higher risk for any of these cardiovascular disease-related outcomes. In contrast, remnant cholesterol, which again, this is data in the fasting state, so it is likely mostly from VLDL, we can see that higher levels of remnant cholesterol were found in people who had a cardiovascular event when compared with no event, and then for every 10 milligrams per deciliter increase for remnant cholesterol, there was a 21% increased risk for having one of these adverse cardiovascular disease-related events. Now, while that says that higher is higher for remnant cholesterol is associated with worse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes, it doesn't uh, indicate more specific values for what could be bad for uh, increasing risk. So to assess that, the authors of this study then looked at quartiles of remnant cholesterol uh, in, in association with risk for heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death, or cardiovascular death. And when using less than 17.5 as the reference for remnant cholesterol, we can see that significantly increased risk for one of these adverse cardiovascular disease-related outcomes was present only when v, uh, remnant cholesterol was about uh, 30.95 or around 31 or higher. So just to summarize that, remnant cholesterol greater than about 31 milligrams per deciliter is associated with a significantly increased CVD risk when compared with lower values, in this case less than 18. Now other studies have also shown uh, uh, higher levels of remnant cholesterol to be associated with atherosclerosis and premature heart attack risk. So for some people that have relatively low, weight, low LDL, the progression of athero atherosclerosis, uh, so fatty streaks in the, in the vasculature, is not eliminated. So why is that? So in this, case, in this uh, study, uh, the authors looked at risk for the presence of having a significant amount of coronary uh, atherosclerosis. And this data is in 134 people with an LDL that is purported to be optimal, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, and 110 of these people were taking a statin. So almost all these people were taking a statin and had what's purported to be optimal levels of LDL cholesterol. So uh, what variables were associated with atherosclerosis in people who have low LDL. So first they looked at diabetes, uh, diabetes and hypertension, and each of these was, were not associated with having a significant amount of coronary atherosclerosis. In contrast, having HDL less than one millimolar, which translates into uh, about 39 milligrams per deciliter, so having low HDL in the presence of low LDL, less than 70, was associated with a three-fold higher odds for having a significant amount of coronary atherosclerosis but the highest risk was present for remnant cholesterol. People who had higher levels of remnant cholesterol had about a four-fold higher risk for the presence of a significant amount of coronary atherosclerosis. So from this, we can uh, conclude that low LDL combined with high VLDL or low HDL may be bad for the progression of atherosclerosis. Now, in another study, there was a higher odds for premature heart attack with higher levels of remnant cholesterol. But note that they also looked at the association for a premature heart attack, which is defined usually uh, as uh, someone who had a heart attack younger than 55 in men and younger than 65 in women. In this case, the study included 35-year-olds, so this is at a much relatively younger age. So not only did they look at uh, levels of remnant cholesterol in association with premature heart attack risk, they also compared a whole bunch of other variables. And variables that were significantly associated with premature heart attack risk were non-HDL cholesterol, so the sum of LDL, lipoprotein A, IDL, and VLDL, higher levels of that, uh, about a threefold higher risk of a premature heart attack, higher triglycerides, a higher remnant to uh, divided by uh, HDL cholesterol ratio, higher total cholesterol, a higher LDL to HDL cholesterol ratio, and then higher levels of ApoB100 containing proteins, which is the sum of LDL, lipoprotein A, IDL, and VDL. But notice that the highest risk for having a premature heart attack 3.87 fold higher risk was present when remnant cholesterol was elevated. So based on the data that I've shown you, uh, uh, it seems that having lower levels of VLDL when considering the aging data and the uh, data for uh, adverse cardiovascular disease related outcomes that lower would be better for VLDL. So uh, what's my data? I've been tracking VLDL for uh, since 2005. So how am I doing with this biomarker? Now from 2000, to 2013, I was tracking my blood test results about once a year and not tracking my diet or, or, uh, or as rigorously as I have been for the past six years. So during the pre-diet tracking phase, I measured 10 times, VLDL 10 times, and my average level during those times was uh, 13.2 milligrams per deciliter. 
Now, in 2015, I started uh, entering all of my data into an online uh, tool, um, Chronometer, uh, and there are many tools. Anybody can use uh, 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 any of these online tracking tools. My fitness pal, uh, any of them will work as long as you're, you know, getting the macros and micros and food amounts, which I then took that data and entered it into an Excel file. So then I can look at the average dietary period that corresponds to each of these blood tests. And because I have enough blood tests, I can look for correlations between my diet with each of these biomarkers to see what in my diet can impact the biomarkers. So uh, when comparing, when looking at my uh, VLDL data from 2015 to the present, which is 30 blood tests, my VLDL, I've actually been able to reduce it with an, uh, to an average of 11 milligrams per deciliter. And when comparing these two groups of data, pre-diet tracking versus the 2015 data and beyond, so uh, during diet tracking, these two groups of data are significantly different based on a t-test. But all isn't uh, uh, fantastic with my VLDL data. Over the past six measurements, my average VLDL is 13.3, uh, which is significantly higher than the previous 24 measurements from 2015 forward. Uh, and those two groups of data, the six versus the 24, are significantly different. So my VLDL over my last six measurements are, are going, is going in the wrong direction. So to get it going back in the right direction towards uh, relatively lower values, um, are there significant correlations for my diet with VLDL? So uh, the variables that I considered for correlations with VLDL were uh, mostly macronutrients. So total calories, total carbohydrate intake, uh, my total fructose intake, which includes fructose, but also uh, one half of sucrose because half of sucrose is uh, fructose. So total fructose intake, total protein, total fiber, total fat, but then also the individual levels of fats, uh, average, average per day, of course. Uh, so MUFA, monounsaturated fats, omega-3 fats, omega-6 fats, and then saturated fats. So of all these variables, were any of them significantly correlated with VLDL? And of them, the one that was most significantly correlated with VL VLDL was my average daily calorie intake, as shown here. So uh, um, what we can see is that the higher, this is a significant positive correlation. So if you can see by the correlation coefficient of 0 0.6, so that's a moderate strength correlation, but the p-value is statistically significant. And when it, when uh, saying that it's a positive correlation, that means that as my uh, calorie intake increases, VLDL correspondingly, correspondingly increases. So um, with the goal of keeping my VLDL uh, towards the low end of my range, uh, we can see that uh, I should shoot, and that's what I've been doing over the past uh, six weeks or so, um, shoot for uh, about 2,500 calories per day or less. So uh, that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, uh, thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and have a great day.